Praise the Lord. Amen. He is to be adored. Amen. For all that he is. So, well, praise God and the Lamb. This morning we get to continue on in part seven of The Secret Place. And uh, this morning we'll be looking at hindrances to answered prayer as our part seven in, in the series. And uh, to illustrate that, we've got, a, as you know, a little, little five-year-old Johnny, very bright little five-year-old Johnny. He, he, uh, he knew his mom was pregnant. She was just two uh, months from delivery. And Johnny told his dad, he said, I want a baby brother. And so uh, the dad said, well, look, mom's gonna be due in a couple of months. Pray for the next two months that God give you a baby brother. God will hear your prayer. So sure enough, for a whole month, Johnny prayed every day to the Lord that God would send him a, a baby brother. And then one of the neighborhood kids told him, hey, you know, that prayer doesn't work. Well, God's not hearing that kind of prayer. Don't even worry with that. Well, Johnny went for the whole next month. After praying a whole month, he went for a whole nother month not praying at all. And sure enough, the two months is over, one praying for a baby brother, next month not praying at all. The mother goes to the hospital, delivers, brings the baby home. And so they have the baby there in the nursery. And so the dad says, come here, I, I wanna show you something. You hadn't seen who we brought home. So he walks little Johnny in, pulls up the blanket there in the nursery, and there's two baby brothers. Mom has given twins to two boys. And so the dad looks over at little Johnny and says, aren't you glad you prayed? Little Johnny looks over at the dad and said, aren't you glad I stopped when I did? So, <laughs> so. you see, Johnny believed God heard his prayer. Matter of fact, he, better, he thought he better stop or God would have heard his prayer even more. But there are certain people who are praying and God's not listening. I know you see the bumper sticker, God listens, and he does. But there's some time he doesn't. Because there are some hindrances, not only sometime he just doesn't hear, sometimes there's just other kind of hindrances that the Bible directly speaks about that we need to listen to this morning. Because we sure don't want to be talking and him not listening. And you may wonder how important, of course every sermon's important, but how important is this to pay attention? Well, let me say it this way. Let's say that this morning, either your home phone or your cell phone either went completely out or it was so bad you couldn't even hardly understand what the other person was saying. You just had a lot of static or interference on your cell phone or your home phone line. Let me ask you this. How quick would it be before you got that problem solved? I believe if you're honest this morning, you'd be on the phone to AT&T service on the way home from church. Come on, be honest, shame the devil. Okay, some of y'all don't think you would. Okay, you'd wait till Monday, or some of you don't even own a phone then, because that's about all there is, because you gotta be honest. You're, you like to be connected with voice and text and information on the internet. You wanna be connected, and you would get that problem solved immediately. You would not wait. What about if your prayer connection's getting that bad? How much more important is that to get that solved immediately? And a lot of people are more concerned about their cell phone coverage and reception than they are their prayer phone coverage and reception. And this morning we wanna see that what the Bible has to say about that. Matter of fact, I almost subtitled today's message. Can you hear me now? Hopefully when we get through this message and the Lord hadn't been here and you're praying, you say, Lord, can you hear me now? Oh yeah, r bright and clear. I hear you great now because you've got rid of those biblically hindrances, biblical hindrances that are in the word that God specifically put in there so that we would know that we wouldn't have to have. You know, of course, with cell phone coverage, it's a little, a little easier to, to hear. You know, either you got a no tone, bad tone or static, but... With here, you're just going to trust that God's word gives us those statics and those areas that hinder us from God either not hearing their prayer or there being some kind of hindrance. Now, with that said though, I don't want to discourage anybody by when you get through these, you may not have these instances 
And it could very well be, and we've heard that as Brother Joe's gone through the secret place prayer series, that it could simply be God's answering a different way than what you prayed, God's answering no, or God's saying you need to wait. And it may not have to do with these. It could be one of those issues. Because you may say, Brother Tim, I don't know what's wrong now, I'm doing that, now God's not hearing. Well, it, he's hearing, but he may be answering different. He may be saying no, he may be giving an answer different what you want, or he may be having you wait. So it could be that as well, but we want to scratch these off first so that we know it's one of those others and not this, because that's how important our prayer reception is. So let's look at the first one, unconfessed sin. Isaiah says, it says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. He does not hear. Did you hear that? Amen. That he does not hear. There's a means of me praying and God does not hear. Why? Well, Isaiah said, it's my iniquity that I have, my unconfessed sin, my sins that I'm not willing to get rid of and make right. They have made this distinction here. Psalm says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. If I'd have cherished, if I'd have kept sin in my heart, something I hadn't got right with God, if I'd have done that, then God wouldn't have listened. Psalms 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are toward who? The righteous, that's those who have their sins confessed and are right with God, and his ears, they're open to their cry. Now, obviously, all of our positional righteousness comes through Christ. That's not what we're saying, but what we're saying here is practical righteousness, living daily with your sins confessed, being right with God. That's who God hears the prayer. Of course, we know this passage very well. The effective prayer of a righteous man, that man who's right with God, that prayer accomplishes much. Don't you want to accomplish much? Well, that righteous man, that one man that's got the, or woman who has their sins confessed, who has things in right standing with God and is not walking around in that known sin, not willing to get it right. Now, the problem most Christians have with this is we minimize our sin and we maximize everybody else's. I don't know if you heard that. Some people in the back may, may have turned up a mic. We minimize our sin, but we maximize everybody else's. That's what I thought you said, okay? Because what we do, we tend to just compare ourselves. In other words, we don't confess our sin because our sin's not that big compared to look at all these big sins. No murder, no robbery, no rapes, no burglaries, no murders. And we tend to minimize our sin and so we don't confess it because it's not that big a deal compared to everybody else. I don't know if you heard, there was a guy, his two brothers, their name was Bill and Bob and they were both billionaires. And one day Bill died. And so Bob went to the pastor and said, I'd like you to do my brother Bill's funeral. Well, the pastor recognized both, he knew both the brothers. They were mean, evil, immoral, cheats, swindlers, the worst of the worst, both of these brothers were. And so as he talked with the Bob, the brother, he said, well, pastor, I want you to do the funeral. And he said, another thing, I want you when you're talking about bro my brother sometime in the funeral to say and refer to him as a saint. And if you do, I'll give this church a million dollars. Well, the pastor began to think, man, his brother was such a scoundrel, such a rotten man, such an immoral man. Gosh, can I do this? But he knew how much the church would like to have that million dollars. And he wanted to keep his conscience clear and still allow the church to get the million dollars. So he said, I'll agree to it. So sure enough, he opens up the funeral message and begins to preach the funeral. And he says to the congregation this, Bill was a lying, cheating, manipulating, selfish, uncaring, mean snake in the grass. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> Kind 
conscience clear and the church gets the million. But see, we do that. We compare ourselves with everybody else to know how righteous we are. But you only compare yourself to one person, then that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the Word said. It's a mirror. Because when you look into the mirror of the Word, that's the true mirror. You don't get up in the morning saying, man, I look awful this morning. But compared to everybody else, I don't look bad, so I'll just leave it the way it is. My hair all messed up. No, you look at what the mirror says, not what everybody else. That's what the mirror of the Word is. If you don't look in the mirror of the Word, then you're going to tend, and I'll tend to say, that's really not sin. And then I don't confess it because I don't even agree with God that it is sin. And what does God do? He's not listening. Don't look at me. That's what the word said. Yeah, but God listens. Well, he does, but the sin's keeping the prayer line cut short. You ever been on the phone and you, you're talking a while and maybe you're a big talker and you know, the reception went down and then you're like, hello, hello, and there was nobody on the other line. And you got to call them back and say, where was I in this conversation? You don't know when I lost you. No, it was after you said three sentences. Man, I talked for 20 minutes after that. You know, and you go back, you think, my, that was sure a wasted time because I was just talking to myself. How many times people have been in prayer that way? <laughs> so he's not listening. His ears are not open to the cry of the, Unrighteous, that is, other than the sinner's prayer. When the sinner, that's, you have to come to God that way. So we see in this incident that we, uh, we can have our prayer line disconnected. Now, really, the rest of these five are all, partial, there are sins. So this is a generic coverage of all of them. But the Bible gives some specifics that the Lord mentions that hinders our prayer connection with Him. How important it is to keep that line open with Him. Another one is selfishness and pride. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You ask, but you don't get. Well, there's some sort of hindrance there. Well, you ever did those, those little word searches where you try to look for the word? Well, I did a little word search on this one. Kind of full of something, isn't it? A little full of you. A little full of me. You, 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 yours. All that prayer is for me. It's all about me. And it's all about what I want. Well, if it's that selfish and that prideful, no wonder I'm not getting what I want to receive. It's too selfish. It's too prideful. It's too just about me. It was E. Stanley Jones who said it best when he said, you know, if you're in a boat out in the lake and you throw your hook out in the water, but it accidentally goes over to the land and hooks the land and you try to reel in, you are not pulling the land towards you. As you get closer to the land, you're pulling you toward the land. So is true with your prayer. You're not trying to bring God's will to you. You're trying to bring your will to God and be His will and find out what He wants. Maybe we say, Lord, I need healing. That's a great prayer. How about this? I need healing because it's keeping me from coming to God's house. Woo, that's a good one. You got an unselfish reason. I want to go and to the house of the Lord. And when I get that health even more, I can go even more. You know, somebody says, you know what? I, I need another job. It's a good one. How about this? If I can get another job, I can be off on Sundays and be in God's house more. Oh, that's good. That's good. You see, part of, part of my motive, yes, I get blessed by both of those prayers, but I'm saying, Lord, uh, I'm asking a prayer that, that benefits the kingdom too. It's just not all about my pleasure. Oh Lord, I can help more people. I can do more of this. Lord, you're, you heal me of this. I can do more of that service that I've been wanting to do for you or whatever the case may be. If it's just for my pleasure, you, 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 me, 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 we can see why we do not receive. That is a hindrance. We know this prayer when we talk about our nation's prayer about my people, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Not just pray, 
we know we're praying, but are we humbling ourselves and seeking his face and turn from their wicked ways? What? Then I will hear, as opposed to without that, I don't. Then I'll hear. The people are turning from their wicked ways. They're seeking the Lord's face, and guess what they're doing? They're also humbling themselves. That was the first of the list. Lord, I, I'm not, it's not that I'm worthy, and it's not that you got to do it because I say do it, and you got to come through just because I say come. You, you're humble about it. Lord, I don't even deserve it. It's where you don't deserve anything. God, everything God gives us is all by grace. Even any answered prayer is still by grace. It isn't like, well, I've done all this for you, now do this for me. We've all run into that before. Lord, why not? Why are you doing this to me? And so we see that part of this disconnect has to do with praying, God, what do you want? Not what I want. You know, Ruth Graham, the wife of Billy Graham, was speaking to an audience of women in Minneapolis and said that if the Lord had answered my way, I'd have married the wrong man several times. And she's glad that Lord didn't answer her prayer her way, but he answered it his way, and she got to marry Billy. Or our life would have been totally different. See, not her own pleasure, but Lord, who do you have for me? Who do you have for me to marry? What's your will? And that always works out the best for us. I've never heard anybody say, I did it my way and not God's way, and I'm sure glad I did. Not one person's ever told me that. If they did, I'll say, just wait a little bit. Come back to see me a little bit later because you'll definitely change your mind. Nobody ever gets testimony to that. I waited it God's way, and it all turned out better. Psalm says, O oh Lord, you have heard the desire of everybody. Mm -mm. You've heard the desire of the humble. You heard their desire, what they wanted, what they prayed for. You answered. The third one is doubting faith. I know you're thinking, well, that's an oxymoron if I've ever heard one. Doubting faith? Well, that's what the scripture says here, James 1, 5. But if any lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who? Who gives to all generously and without reproach and it will be given to him. Lord, I need wisdom in this situation. I need to know which way to go on this. But he must ask, he's gonna ask for that. He's gotta ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man, a man that has doubting faith ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Lord, I'm not getting anything from you. <laughs> there you go right there. That may be it. Maybe that's the prayer line disconnect that we're not believing God. Hebrews 11, 6 says that we must come to him. In order to come to him, we must one, believe that he is. That's the first thing and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Two things I need to go when I come to God. One, I gotta believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God said that. When you come to me, you gotta believe that I am, and you gotta believe I am a rewarder. Okay, Lord, I'll, I'll believe that. I believe that you are and that you're a rewarder. See, a lot of people don't believe that. God is a rewarder and he seeks to reward. And I have faith in him that he'll do that. But see, you have to, most people, their doubt comes in two ways. Either God has given you an answer in the past that you didn't like and so you quit praying and you quit believing or he's making you wait or having you wait and it's causing you to doubt. You see, there was a radio broadcast where the pastor, he came on every week and listened to questions come in. And he was a grandfather kind of figure, real soft-spoken, real kind. And everybody that called the station just loved talking to him because of his mannerism. One lady called, she said, look, 
Pastor, I, I was born blind. I've accepted being born blind. Now I'm in my 30s and I'm still blind. And I've accepted that that's God's will right now. She said, but I have well-meaning friends that tell me, if you had more faith, you would be able to see and God would heal you of that blindness. And she said, I can live with the blindness, but I, that is really what hurts me. So she, their audience is waiting on the pastor's reply. Hear this great biblical response. The pastor says, do you carry one of those little walking still white canes, you know, for blindness? He said, yeah, I do. He said, the next time somebody tells you that, hit them upside the head with it. <laughs> then ask them this, does that hurt? And they'll say, absolutely, and said it wouldn't if you had more faith. <laughs> See, there's some things that God determines for us and it isn't a matter of our faith, it's a matter of God's will. And we can have all the faith we can, but if God determines that's what it needs to be, even Paul prayed three times, Lord, remove this thorn in the flesh from me. And God said, I ain't gonna do it, basically, because my grace will be sufficient for this situation. And Paul didn't go the rest of the scripture and say, well, I'm not gonna pray anymore and I'm not gonna believe God anymore and I'm gonna doubt because now I pray and God don't even answer. Well, no, he answered differently what you wanted, but Paul, you see the rest of the scriptures, he still has faith. He, he doesn't just say, well, I'm not gonna have faith and doubt God. You see, the scriptures are also there. We know we have faith if we obey. That's how our faith is really demonstrated. A lot of people, I got faith, I got faith, I got faith. Well, let me ask you this. Are you obeying everything that you know is in the word of God right now? Because if you have faith, you will because you're thinking this is the word of God. And God says, if I do this, I'll be blessed. So I'm gonna do it. If you don't do it, that means you don't have faith. And that's usually where faith is, lack of faith is demonstrated is by not obeying the word of God. Wasn't it Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember, they were getting ready to throw them in the fiery furnace and the king was gonna throw them in there. And you know what they said? Our God is able to deliver us. So that's faith. But then you think this next statement was, but if he doesn't, what do you mean if he doesn't? If he doesn't, we're still not gonna obey your command to worship those idols. I don't care what he does. He can get us out of there. He can let us burn to death. But if he doesn't deliver us, we're still gonna obey him and not do what you said. Amen. King, we're not gonna bow down. See, that's faith. I can still say if and say, God, whatever your will is. I don't see him out there, so I'm gonna talk about him. Anyway, many of you are familiar with Brother Boyd Hill. He loves hamburgers. I don't know if you know that. If you know him well, he is a hamburger connoisseur. If you wanna know anything about hamburgers, I always tell him, he, he, the only reason he travels is so he can go to other cities and try out their hamburger places in other cities. But this place that he loves is in Oklahoma City called Johnny's Hamburgers his favorite place to go. Matter of fact, when he goes, I get a text that shows him eating a hamburger. I'm serious, he just, you know, oh. And one year, both of our daughters were in a basketball tournament in Oklahoma City. And of course, you know where Boyd wanted all the basketball team to go, Johnny's Hamburgers, because I'd heard about this all my life from him, or at least from the time I've known him. And then here we are at Johnny's Hamburgers. Of course, I'd already heard what Boyd said and then now we're in the place and he's explaining the menu and going over the menu and telling what to order and how to order and what to do and what the best to get. And boy, you know, just like, good, 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 man. This is the Omri. Well, you know, I could have came home from that Oklahoma trip. And somebody said, how was Johnny's? And I said, brother Boyd did a great sermon. He, he broke down the menu. He, he alliterated it, he talked about it, he described it in great terms with great illustrations. He, he gave explanation, he gave illustration, he, he described everything. I was there in the place, it was a great atmosphere, all the things looked good. Well, they said, how was the hamburger? I didn't eat any hamburgers, but next week, Brother Boyd's gonna give another sermon on the menu at Johnny's. We're gonna study it even further. Look, there comes a time, and I'm, we all study, we have Wednesday night studies, we have Bible saying we need to keep studying because that explanation, that menu really helped me. But there's a time that we've studied and we studied and we studied, but we're not obeying. 
We're not doing. We're hearers of the word and not doers. I said, brother boy, that's enough. I'm getting me a Johnny hamburger and I'm gonna eat that thing and enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? It's a time to listen and a time to obey. We amen the word, we study the word, we go to seminars on the word, we quote the word. That's great, but we have to obey the word. That's faith. Faith without works is dead. That's doubting faith. The way we doubt the most is to say, I'm not obeying that. That's, that's a doubting. That's a doubt. And that hinders, I believe, our connection in prayer. The fourth one is unbiblical treatment of your spouse. Hello. Don't tune me out here now. It says in first in Peter 3, 1, in the same way, you wives, be submissive to your husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. You husbands, in the same way it says in verse seven, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker. That means more frail that, you know, that you're there, not weakness in the sense they're not smart or anything like that. It's a, in the sense that you want to treasure them like something like China. Since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, listen men, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Um, John R. Rice, he flees, it doesn't say it directly, but the wife, it's inferred that the wife's prayers for salvation of her husband may be blocked by her disobedience because not only how she's behaving, she's probably also praying for the husband. That's inferred, but guys, it's pretty black and white on the scriptures that it does hinder our prayers when we're not treating our wife in this biblical way. You say, is it a total disconnect? It says hindered. That's enough for me. <laughs> I don't want anything to hinder my prayer. At the very moment I need a prayer answered, I want that prayer answered. I want it heard. I don't want any hindrance. And so there we've got to take note that, Lord, we, we want to make sure that things are not hindered in your kingdom and in the prayer that we would have. Are you treating your spouse in a biblical way? I believe it boils down that if we're not, I believe there's great hindrances. Tony Evans believes 1 Corinthians 11, 10 also is a hindrance there. We won't have time to go over all that, but I believe it's pretty clear that we need to make sure that we're in biblical obedience in the way we're treating our spouses, especially here it goes, guys, for us. It's very clear. The next one is stubborn idol worship. I know some of you are saying, Phew. well, those others kind of beat me up, but praise God I don't do this because I don't have one of those statues in the backyard. Well, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. That's not, that's not necessarily what it is. It is an idol worship. It's not the one that most people do here. Jeremiah says this, though they will cry to me, I will not listen to them. This is God speaking. Then, then it goes on in verse 12. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the little g, the gods to whom they burn incense. That's their idols but they surely will not save them in the time of their disaster. Let me explain. What is idol worship? It's really just two things. It boils down to, is there anything more important in priority and in reality in your life than God? I'll say it again. Is there anything greater priority in energy, in time, in devotion, in priority than God. If it is, whatever that is, that's your God. Because you've made something higher. Look, if God's not first place in your life, you've not placed God as God in your life. For God to be God in your life, he's got to be first place. Because whatever you bump ahead of him, that's your God. 
It can be many things. It can be career. It can be money. It can be success. It can be home. It can be future. It can be security. It can be health. It can be anything that we place in more value and more priority than God. And you know what? If we made that our God, maybe why God's not listening and He's saying there, as they burn it, surely they will not save them. In other words, cry to them. If you've made money your God, and money's more important than God, and you get an emergency, say, dear money, save me. And you say, oh wait, money won't save me here. This is my God, but it's, it's not gonna come. Through. Hold on just a minute, let me call out to God. But God's not your God. He's saying, go ahead and cry out to your God. But your God won't be able to do it in that situation. Now you say, well, my God's been able to help me out so far because people do rely on various things to get them through. Then they get in a situation where they need God and then maybe God's saying, well, make me God in your life. Because he's letting you know those gods that you burn incense to, those gods that you put more priority. Here's another way we idol worship. Here is how God says he is. But a lot of people say, here's how I think God is. Or they're in a situation or a sin and they say, here's how I think God thinks about it. And God's okay with this. And God looks the other way on this. And God really means this. And God really means that. No, this is what God really means. And if you make God into any other God than this God, that's idol worship. You're worshiping some other God. The God of our own forming in our mind. This is how I picture God. That's out of worship. This is how I want God to be is really what we're saying. I'd rather him be like this and like this and dislike this other than what his words. No, he is who he says he is. And I have to worship him either like that or go worship my idol of him being the God that I want him to be. Right? This is who he is. And this is the only way we can worship him is how who he really is. And so it's clear that these people was, were not having their prayers heard because look what happens in verse 14. Therefore do not pray. Ooh, that, you don't see that very often in the Bible. Do not pray for these, this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them. For I will not listen when they call to me because of their disaster. I ain't gonna listen. They go call on their gods, the ones who they really truly worship, because I'm not gonna listen. Wow. I mean, if I have these gods if I don't really prioritize God, if I don't, if I'm trying to make God into somebody he's really not and worshiping him the way he really is, that's gonna hinder my prayer. Don't tell him why, how many prayers don't get anywhere. Because people are experiencing this and God says, you can go to your God for that. And you'll find out your God's not gonna answer. Zechariah says it this way. But they refused to pay attention and they turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears from hearing. You ever done that? You know, you see something in the Word and it's like, ah, I'm not going to pay attention to that. And what you do, you turn that stubborn shoulder and say, I'm not going to listen to that. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear that. Change the subject, Pastor. Change the topic. Flip over another chapter of the Bible. I don't want to hear that. So he said, you don't, you're not paying attention to what I'm saying. Does God still speak? He speaks through his word, even today. He's talking loud and clear. Every time you read a scripture, he's talking. And God said, these people, they're not paying attention. They're turning a stubborn shoulder and they're clogging up their ears. They don't want to hear what I'm saying. Okay, so you got something in the word you don't want to hear from God. And just as he called, and they would not listen, so they called, 
and I would not listen. God speaking? Don't want to hear. Don't want to hear that. Dear Lord, oh, I can speak and you not listen, and then you speak and you want me to listen. So I'm not going to listen. Who says that? Says the Lord of hosts. Yeah, but that bumper sticker says God. Let... Well, he does. And we see many instances of that. But there's times, according to Scripture, he doesn't. And we got to say, Lord, is that the reason? Maybe my prayers are not being heard. If your word said it, I have to believe it. And then the last one, being unmerciful and unforgiving. Being unmerciful and unforgiving. If a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. And I know we have to be discerning. There's all kind of people asking for various things and you have to have a discerning spirit. But we're talking about a person's heart here. It's showing mercy. That if people are mercy, trying to receive mercy and we don't show mercy, then maybe we'll cry out and not hear a merciful cry. Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 7? Blessed are the merciful. That means people who show mercy. Why? for they will receive mercy. I don't know about you, a lot of my prayers, Lord, have mercy on me. I messed up. God, don't, don't give me what I deserve in this situation. Please show me mercy. I messed up here, help me. Well, let's look. How merciful you've been to everybody else. Oops. Oops. No, everybody got to measure up my book. That person didn't do this, and that person didn't do that, and that person forgot to do this, and bless God, they're getting what they deserve. Bless God. Okay, so you're gonna go in prayer, and you're perfect? As you go to God in prayer, you're not cutting anybody slack, you're not showing any mercy, but then you go to God and ask for mercy. What if God's looking at the mercy book? Of course, it's all in his head. Well, let's check and see how merciful you've been to everybody else. See if you'll get mercy. Oh, have mercy. <laughs> We've got to show mercy to other people. Why? Because we want God to show mercy on us. And, and that's part, and, you know, and Jesus, he, he says in, in, in Mark eleven twenty five, whenever you stand praying, which you can be in all kind of postures, but look how he says it. When you stand praying, comma, what do I need to do every time I pray? Jesus said, it's comma, in one word, whenever you pray, you've got to always forgive. Amen. Comma, if you have anything against anyone, comma, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your trespasses. I don't know about you, but asking God to forgive me for my trespasses can be common. Don't look at me that way. If you do, then you need to come tell me how you're living perfect and you don't ever have to ask God for forgiveness. Because I do. But that tells me what I better be doing when I ask God to forgive me when I pray. I better make sure there's no one I, it says there, if anyone has anything against somebody, you go make that right. The best of your ability to live at peace with all men, get it right. Forgive. Why? Because you're, so that your Father in heaven will forgive you, your trespasses. I don't want to go in prayer and say, Lord, forgive me for that. Oh. I didn't forgive them for that, did I? I didn't forgive them for that. This is so that. In order that. I've got to not let my prayer be so hindered when I pray that it's, he's not going to forgive. I want him to be able to say, look, you've been merciful to others. 
You've shown forgiveness to others. You don't, you're not holding anything against others. You see, that they're, that's showing. Yes, all of it's by grace. None of it's earned. But he shows here that I need to make sure that relationship with other people is right. Because so much of my prayer is to be right with God and to have my sins forgiven. John Oglethorpe once went to the famous pastor, John Wesley, and Oglethorpe told Wesley, I never forgive. To which John Wesley said, then sir, I hope you never sin. Because if you sin, you better be a forgiver so that you can get your forgiveness. God makes it clear. You know, they say trappers in some of these jungles, in order to catch a particular monkey, they build a box. And they build this wooden box and they put a hole in it and they, inside the box they put an orange. And they make sure the opening to the hole is just a little bit smaller than the orange. And they chain the box to a tree. Well, the monkey goes around, smells the orange, looks in there, sees the orange, reaches in there, grabs the orange, and when he brings it back out of the hole, it's stuck. And so the trappers go and they catch the monkey. But brother Tim, that monkey's not trapped. He's not caught, it's not a snare, a trap where all he has to do is let go and he's free. Well, you are so smart, you already got the illustration. You didn't give me time to give it to you. Let it go. Let it go. And get free. But you hold on to it like it's some kind of prize. Ugh. I'm not going to let that go. I'm holding on to that because if I let that go, they're going to get away with it and they're going to think that was okay. Mm, I got it and I'm hanging on to it for the rest of my life. Well, you're in captivity the rest of your life. Satan will come and grab you because you are just like those trappers. They're looking for you. And all you gotta do is free yourself. Lord, I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna let you take care of that. If there was something done wrong to me, you, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, you'll take care of it. That ain't my business anyway. Free. Not really complicated. Not only does that free you and liberate you, it also opens up this deal that now when you ask for forgiveness in your prayer, you can gain forgiveness because you're being merciful and you can obtain mercy when called upon. What are they? Unconfessed sin, selfish pride, doubt, spousal mistreatment, idol worship, and unforgiveness. They all hinder. I don't know about you, but a lot of people carry their cell phones for various reasons, but a big one is in case of emergency, and that's not when you should always pray. <laughs> but boy, when you're in that emergency, and you're thinking, my goodness, right now, I gotta call 911, this is a bad one, and to reach for that phone and it not work. There's no connection. I don't know about you, I want to make sure these things aren't one of the reasons my prayer is not being answered. It may be Lord saying no. It may be a saying I want, I want a different answer. It may be saying it'll wait in time. And it may be all that, but I want to make sure it's not any of these because if my cell phone's that important to get it done today, I want my prayer line in line today because that's more important to me. God, I'm in this situation. Lord, help me. And I sure don't want to hear this. I'm not listening. Or that line's been hindered. I want to make sure that these things are not part of my life because it's so crucial to stay in contact with the one who has all the knowledge, all the information, all the wisdom, all the resources that I need daily, not just in an emergency. I need it all the time. Lord, help us that our prayer lines are not hindered, cut off, or disconnected. Let's pray with every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet.